So next up we've got Dan Cale, so we're sticking to a schedule. So Dan Cale will take us through to 12.50. Dan Cale is one of our trainers now, so if you have done a course recently, you will have had seen Dan through training. If not, Dan Cale has gone from franchisee to franchisor and, and trainer in a pretty quick succession. And Dan's built a large business as well. So he's going to take us to, through to lunch at 12.50. Then Dan, after 12.50, we're going to have Mike Handys come back on as well. So if you do have questions for Mike, Thanks, maybe Mike. write them down. And then after the lunch break, ask Mike anything you'd like as well. So I hand it over to Dan. Thanks, Dan. Oh, thanks. Thanks, guys. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but that was just like there was just so much to take in there, mate. Uh, there's a lot, lot of knowledge there. I don't know how I'm going to beat that. I don't think anyone should expect me to come anywhere close to that. Uh, so, no, that was, that was awesome. You've just, you know, blown my mind. Um, all right, so I'll give you guys a bit of a rundown. Um, I've been with gyms for coming on five years soon. Um, I started off as a franchisee, um, was getting trained by Mike Davenport back when I was a franchisee. Um, and so when I come on board, I come on board because I was in a terrible financial position uh, when I decided to join gyms. So I'd gone out and I'd bought this house um, right across the road from my mum and, uh, from, sorry, my wife's mum and dad's house. Um, and the reason I'd done that was because I've seen how unhappy she was. Um, she was always she was always driving to and from our house, which was in Caram Downs. I don't know if many of you guys know that area, to her, to um, to her parents' place. Um, and you know, everything was sort of rocky. We had we had a kid and another one on the way, and I seen that she was happiest when she was around her her family. So I went, well, I've I've got to do something now. Me and her worked at McDonald's at the time, um, which anyone here would know, it's it's not great money. Um, at all. And so I went and bought this house literally right across the street from her mum and dad's place. And uh, sort of like Everybody Loves Raymond, if anyone knows that show. Um, and this, this place, uh, it cost me an arm and a leg. It was $1,000 a week, the mortgage repayments on it. And working at McDonald's, both of us, uh, with a kid and another one on the way, uh, well, I didn't really do the math correctly and it just wasn't going to work. Um, so I had, this, I had to make a change. Um, and I was like, all right, well, what can I do to be able to earn me some more money? What am I going to possibly do? Um, and so I started thinking, well, maybe I can do a trade. Uh, but that, very soon after, I realized, well, I'd need to be an apprentice for four years. It's not possible. So I started thinking, all right, well, I've got to make a change. Right now is the time. I've always sort of wanted to run my own business. However, I know nothing at all, zero, about running a business. So I was like, well, it sounds like a good idea to me. Let's give it a crack. Um, so I... Uh, <laughs> So I uh, start looking around for different businesses. Um, you know, all these thoughts going through my head. Do I get a cafe? Do I get a fish and chip shop? Rah, rah, you know, just constantly thinking about it. And I was like, what can I possibly afford? Now, we had about 50 grand sitting aside um, that we, because we'd sold our house. Um, we'd put a deposit on this new house and we had 50 grand spare from it. Um, and so this 50 grand wasn't going to last very long, not with the mortgage that I had and another child on the way. Um, and so I started thinking, well, I really don't know anything about business. What's something simple that I can do? What's something that I, I'm not going to stuff up? And so I come to the idea of, well, I, I, knew, I knew a family member that had a son that was out there mowing lawns and, this, and he was about 12 years old. And I went, well, if a 12 year old can do it, I reckon I can do it. And so <laughs> that was basically the basis behind it. So I went, all right, well, lawn mowing sounds all right. What are the pros to it? And so I went, well, grass always grows. There's always weeds there. So, oh, Everything in nature, there's always going to be something that grows. Trees, hedges, whatever it bloody well is. So there's always, this is a very safe industry. Um, and at the time, I, I think everyone was pretty worried, and people still are, that we're you know, worried we'll go into a recession and industries will just completely fail. Um, so I went, well, this seems like a very safe industry. I mean, it's always going to be there. Um, and so then I went, well, what else, what else do I need to think about? And then I realized that the expenses weren't all that much in it. And so I went, well, this is something I'm probably not going to fail at. Um, so... I'll, I'll, I'll take a look into this a bit more. So I called up gyms, and the reason I called up gyms was quite simply, uh, when I thought of lawn mowing, I thought of gyms mowing. It was just hand in hand. Like when I think of a hamburger, I think of McDonald's, same thing with gyms mowing. Um, so I call up gyms mowing, and I figured, well, it's already gonna be, I reckon this is something I'm not gonna fail at already. Can everyone hear me all right? Yep. Cool, all right, no worries. Yeah, my wife always says that I've got a very loud voice, so hopefully uh, that's a benefit today. Um, so, I, uh, yeah, I call them up and I go, well, they, they must have some sort of way to be able to make it easier for me. They're the, the industry leader. They have more work than anyone else. And that was sort of the one thing that was always playing on my mind. How am I going to find the work? I know it's out there. I know it's out there. How am I going to get in front of these people to get that work? Because there's all these different independents driving around nonstop. Dales, mowing, lawn and garden care, Chelsea, whatever it bloody well is. 
And so I went, well, I'll call them up and I'll see what they can do for me. So sure enough, I call up Jim's Mowing and I get on the, uh, I get on the phone to them and they say, the, franchise, the franchisor is going to call you back within two hours. Cool, cool, no worries. He calls me back within two hours and I have to hit, endure this long spiel, this whole full sales pitch. And I was just like, all right, yep, cool. All, whew, all over my head. Um, but he said one thing to me that really got me going. And he said to me, he goes, we have a guarantee, a paid for work guarantee. So if you don't make at least $1,500, we'll pay it to you. Um, as, long as, you, as long as you do the pay for work guarantee. And as soon as I heard that, I went, ding, ding, ding. All right, that's sounding good because my mortgage is $1,000. I need something to be able to pay this mortgage. Um, and this is gonna be able to help alleviate that pressure. I'm not gonna have to go and get a trade and, and wait four years. So sure enough, I sign up. Um, now my first, first week in, I've done the training at National, I've done all that. You know, I've written down everything I possibly can. Uh, first week in, um, I knew nothing about using any lawn mowers, certainly not commercials. I'd gone out for a day with a bloke, uh, another franchisee. Um, I, knew, I didn't know how to brush cut, didn't know how to blow, didn't know anything. Didn't know how to talk to customers, um, didn't know how to quote. And um, yeah, so sure enough, I was like, well, I must be ready, let's go do it. And so first week in, um, I'm working, and I, this is the one thing that I had. This is the one thing I knew I had. I knew I could work hard, and I knew I had to do whatever it took to make it work because I put my family in this position where we were financially stuffed. And so I had, I had no choice. I had to make this work. Um, and so the first week in, I'd work seven days that week, um, nonstop. I'd stuffed up many jobs. I'd got several complaints. Um, I was terrible. Um, and um, I'd ripped myself off several, several quotes and done these jobs that I was spending all these hours at. Um, but still, at the end of the week, by the Sunday, I'd, I'd made $3,600 for that week. And uh, knowing that, I'd gone, yes, like finally, I've found something that I'm gonna be able to see if I can make this work. So anyways, I'd spoken to the franchisees at our meeting, the meeting had come up, told them all, you know, I'd made 3,600 in my first week. And I get a lot of, there was a lot of hate from it actually, believe it or not, they were like, that's not possible. You can't possibly make 3,600 in your first week. I've never done that in a week, rah, rah. And so I was like, well, no, it's true. I just worked really, really bloody hard. And so I explained to him, I worked from seven o'clock in the morning till it got dark. And then I went home and then I was stuffed. And then I had to help in a bath and, you know, sleep for 10 hours and go and do it the next day. And so because these guys were like, no, nah, it's not true, rah, rah, won't happen again. Well, that then gave me some sort of motive to be like, hey, screw you guys. <laughs> I'm going to do it again. And so next week I went out there. Now the, the issue is with the next week is I didn't have any work on because stupid me decided not to do any marketing that first week. I was too busy focusing on doing the work. Um, so I had no, I had no jobs um, for that next week. So I had to learn how to market and I had to learn how to do it quick. Now I, the word marketing to me, it was like from another planet. I had no idea what it bloody well was. Uh, as I said, I was 24 years old at the time. And uh, at 24, I don't know about what you guys were like, but um, yeah, I wasn't all that bright. I had no idea about anything, much less business or marketing. Um, so I spoke with my franchisor and he said, have you got all your leads turned on? Oh, no, I've got them on for local. We'll put them on for all areas. All right, cool. Um, he goes, have you gone through the unserviced report? I go, I don't even know what the bloody hell the unserviced report is. Um, so does everyone in here know what the unserviced report is? Yep. You know how to find it as well? Yep, cool, good. Okay, cool. Yeah, you were like me. Uh, all right, so unserviced report, you go into Jim's online. Um, there's a few tabs up the top. One of them will say reports. You drop down that tab and you'll have unserviced leads. Go into that and then choose a time frame. So I usually chose three months back. So I'd go from, you know, August till, I don't know, what, June? Um, and then I'd go, all right, my, my division only. Um, and then I'd untick so that it was... Uh, so I'd see every, all the regions, but for my division only, and then update it, and you'll see all the unservice reports, uh, unservice leads come through. Then you can basically cherry pick through them and choose whichever one you want. You'll pay the uh, same fee as a normal lead fee. Um, so sure enough, I went through this unservice report, started cherry picking jobs through there. Um, and then I went out and um, you know, we, had, we had business cards at the time, um, and we had flyers, or had business cards and flyers. So I went and did letterbox drops all around my neighborhood non-stop, so I'd work as many hours as I possibly could throughout the day for as many jobs that I had. I would have kept working if I had more jobs, but I didn't have more jobs. So I'd go on out and I'd do like two hours worth of work for a day or whatever it was. And so I had this thing in my head where I was like, I felt guilty if I wasn't working at least eight hours a day. There was this sort of guilt to it because I wasn't doing as much as I possibly could. 
Um, so for the next six hours, I'd go out and I'd do letterbox drops um, throughout all the streets, and it sucked. It really did, but uh, me and my wife would do it. We had our pram and, you know, going and doing all the streets. She'd have the car and drive up to the end of the street by the time I'd done that one. Um, and so we're doing all these letterbox drops. And uh, I'd also gone out and I'd spoken with a couple of real estate agents in my area. Um, but I didn't call them up. I, I, my franchisor, um, Jeff, he, he told me um, to, go and, to go and see them face to face. And um, so I went in there face to face, presented well, I've got me business cards, got me flyers, you know, all eager, trying to, trying to win as many jobs as I possibly can and uh, start making relationships with them. And, and sure enough, they actually gave me a few jobs. Um, and so that next week from doing that nonstop, seven days a week again, from seven o'clock in the morning till dark, um, I went out and I made $3,650 that week. So I made $50 more. And it was just this incredible feeling of relief. I can't even explain it. It was kind of like, I've just hit the golden ticket. I know I can work hard. I know I can do this. And now I can take care of my family. I just have to keep doing this. Um, and so I, uh, I realized that from, from doing all this marketing, you know, the business cards, they were all right. They weren't bad, um, but they weren't as good as what they could have been for doing the, the letterbox drops. And I realized I could do a better job of marketing because I hadn't done any marketing the week before. So I'd only done marketing through the week to be able to build sales for that week, which is how I got the 3,650. Now, the benefit of that is the next week, well, I had more jobs coming through for the next week because I'd done marketing. And so I realized, well, if I keep doing this, hopefully, if I keep on continuing to do my local area marketing, finding new ways, um, bringing work on and filling up this week and then trying to fill up the next week as well, well, I'll, I'll make more money. And sure enough, that's what I did. So I went out and every week I was pushing myself hard and I was learning how to use the equipment better. And so after, after about two months, so eight weeks in, I was earning $5,000 a week. Um, this is revenue, sales. Um, so um, I was making $5,000 a week, still busting me guts, absolutely busting me guts. Um, but I was becoming better at talking to the customers, better at using the equipment and, and certainly better at marketing. Um, so I'm making $5,000 a week, but I knew that I could still do it better. I, I still knew that I, I wasn't pushing it as hard as I possibly could. I knew there was more room for improvement. So I had, um, I'd, I'd got magnets instead of business cards now. I'd got these little magnets, same size as the business cards, and I'd get a little paper clip and I'd put them on the fly and I'd start putting them in people's letterboxes. Now the issue was, is that I run out of territory space to do letterbox drops. So I call up my franchisor and I say, hey, are you all right if I go and do it in, in other areas that other franchisees don't own? He goes, I don't know, mate. You're going to have to talk to the franchisees at the next meeting about it. So sure enough, I, at the next meeting, I speak with them and I stand up in front of them and I just say, is anyone okay if I start doing letterbox drops in areas that no one else owns? It's a vacant territory. Sure enough, they were like, yeah, that's fine. It doesn't bother us. Go for it. Um, so beautiful for me. I went out and started doing it with magnets and I had a much better success rate. I was actually earning on average about an extra $1,000 a week for the next 10 weeks from doing these magnet drops instead of the business cards. Um, and then, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm doing better, better marketing. And I've also, what I've done is I've started to consolidate my round. So I've started, what I used to do is I'd just go from, because I needed the work and I was hungry for it, I'd go from suburb to suburb to suburb to suburb. I'd go like five different suburbs in a day just to be able to get this work. Um, and so I started, now that I had more customers coming on, I started consolidating my round and I was sticking to one or two suburbs a day. So I was able to earn more profit because I was traveling less. I figured every time I'm not behind a mower pushing, pushing a mower, I'm not making money. If I'm on the road, I'm not making money. So I had to be behind the mower at all times. Um, so I've started consolidating my round. I've started doing better marketing. And uh, I've also, from that marketing, what happened is I've started creating more demand. Um, and so this is, this is something that I didn't realize at the time how important it was, um, but I certainly know now. Um, and so I've, I've created more demand. Um, and the issue was is that from, get, from that $5,000 a week point, I could get to about $7,000 if I was lucky um, a week, um, but I couldn't really get too far past that. And it really annoyed me because I wanted to get to this $10,000 mark. It was, like, it was now like, it was no longer about the money. I had money now. I knew I could take care of my family. I knew I was gonna be all right. Now I wanted to see how far I could push this. I wanted to see what the p potential of a Jim's mowing business was um, and certainly how far, how far I could take it. And so w whether that meant me walking twice as fast while I was using the mower or you know, taking, um, finding new procedures and processes to mow a, lawn, mow a lawn faster or get to the next property a couple minutes quicker or get out of the car a little bit faster. I was trying to find 
the absolute maximum, what I could do. Um, and so I started creating more demand from doing all this marketing. And um, from having more demand, I realized that, well, I'd run out of time. So what if I just took the best paying jobs and I just got the best paying jobs and I filled in my time with these amazing paying jobs? So I put my prices up, uh, which is what Mike said before. You know, if you, if you can't take on any more leads, if you're not taking on any more leads, you either hire or you put your prices up. So I put my prices up and I put them up to $2 a minute for regular lawn mowing and $3 a minute for once off jobs. Um, which is you know 120 an hour for, for regular or half an hour is 60 bucks and for the once off you know 90 for half an hour and 180 for an hour so i put my prices up because i could no longer fit in these jobs and i wanted to get the best paying jobs and i didn't think i'd win all that many jobs from this but i didn't want to because i didn't have any time um and so what ended up happening was i still ended up winning about seven out of ten jobs still won seven out of ten jobs at three dollars a bloody minute like how mental is that um and so I'd started realizing how powerful this brand is at, around this point. I'd really started understanding that the customers, they didn't care about Dan. They didn't care about me doing their job. They cared about using Jim's mowing to do their job. They wanted Jim's the same way that I wanted McDonald's for a hamburger. Um, and they're willing to pay for it. And so once I started realizing how powerful that brand is and what I can possibly charge and still customers are going to take it, um, well, that's when I went, well, <laughs> geez, there's, there's some serious potential in this. I reckon I can take this further. And so I did. Um, so I'm now at a point where I'm earning about $7,000 a week on average. I'm about four months in. And I've got, as I said, I've got this unique problem where um, I can't fit any more work in. And, this, and the reason I can't fit any more work in is because I, uh, I've got all these regular customers. You now, about six months in, I had about 80 regular customers on my books. Um, and I, it was from bringing on three new regular customers a week. Um, and by this time, I'd already removed all the existing customers that I bought the business with because they all got the price rise for the regular mowing. And sure enough, they weren't going to take it because beforehand, they were at a dollar a minute. So they're sure, sure as hell not going to go up to $2 a minute. So they just, whew, see you later. Um, anyways, and so I, uh, I brought on my first employee. Now, I had no idea how to bring on an employee. Um, and so I didn't want to do anything wrong because I didn't want to lose my house. But I also knew I wasn't experienced enough to be able to do it. So what did I do? I brought on my younger brother because I figured, well, <laughs> I'm going to stuff it up somehow. I knew I was, but at least if I stuff it up with my younger brother, he's not going to take my house from me. So, um, so I bring him on, and now that was, that was actually quite easy to bring him on as an employee because he's my younger brother. He had a job at McDonald's that I got him, and so I just said, Alex, you're coming to work for me. And he was like, oh, I don't know about that. Alex, you're coming to work for me. Bang, done. So sure enough, he's working for me now. He's taking care of my regular customers. I had these, I had these regular customers I was getting paid $2 a minute from when I wanted to be doing the $3 minute jobs. I was focusing on these once-off jobs that I wanted to do. So he takes care of this, this huge problem I have, which is where I don't want to earn $120 an hour. I mean, what a problem to have. Um, and so he starts doing these customers for me. Um, and he, sure enough, he loves it. He really loves doing this job. Um, which was fantastic for me because it meant that he, he put a lot of effort and in, in care into it and, and probably more so than what I did with the customers. He knew them like the back of his hand. He knew this week on Monday, I'm going to be down at Sue and Lily's house and on Thursday next week, I'm going to be at David's place. So he knew the customers like the back of his hand. I'd, I'd probably gone out there with him for about a month nonstop teaching him all these customers and it didn't take him long to, to be able to pick it up. And so now he's making me about $3,500 a week in sales from doing these 80 regular customers for me. Um, and I'd gone, well, that's brilliant. That takes care of that problem. Now I can focus on these $3 a minute jobs because I've got the demand because I'm doing the marketing to be able to bring these jobs in. Um, so I'm now focused on these $3 a minute jobs. So I'm now at the point where I'm earning minimum seven grand a week by myself, uh, not including what Alex was making for me. But there's a lot of weeks where I'm out, actually out there making 10 grand a week by myself doing these $3 a minute jobs. Now I was busting me guts. I was working bloody hard. I think anyone here... Uh, you guys are all obviously experienced. You guys know what it's like to be busting your guts all day out in the hot weather or you might get stuck in the rain and you just got to get the job finished because you want to make the customer satisfied. You want to try and keep taking on work. So I'm, I'm out there busting my guts doing it and uh, it was very, very tiring. It was, it was uh, exhausting actually doing all these once-off jobs and going through the whole process. And, um, and so I went, well, this is, I'm not going to be able to do this forever. I've got to come up with some sort of idea on how I can continue to make money but not have to put myself through absolute torture every day. And so sure enough, um, another six months went by. 
and we're doing fantastic. And I bring on my second employee because I'd got another 80 regular customers. And when I brought on my second employee, it's then that I realized, hey, I've actually got a proper business here. I've now got two employees, both doing 80 customers a week for, uh, 80 customers, uh, regular customers for me. So usually about 40 a week that would do on a fortnightly schedule. Um, and they're both making me three and a half grand a week and they, and they, and they love it. And I'm still able to go out there and do my once off, once off work. So these guys are making me seven grand every week. Um, and so I went, well, I'm going to stick to this. I don't, you know, I, don't, I don't know business very well, but I know this because I've gone and done it twice. Um, and so sure enough, that's what I did. So after three years, I had six employees working for me, one every six months, each of them making me three and a half grand a week. Um, and sure enough, I was making over $20,000 a week in sales from having these guys do my work for me. Um, it, was, it was fantastic, but it's also it's quite a bit to manage, as you, can, as you can imagine. So at this point, I've got myself off the tools, completely off the tools, um, and I'm now doing uh, quoting, scheduling, invoicing, and just making sure, keeping up with the day-to-day, -day, making sure the equip equipment's running right. So I do little things like a pre-shift every morning with the employees. So every morning before we start work, so we'd get there, they'd get to my property at 6.30, we'd go through the schedule for them. Um, I'd have descriptions written out on every single uh, customer's job. So you've got your daily job schedule that you guys would obviously all know about. So you've got a description section, which I never really used. But then obviously once you've got all these employees, you need to use it because otherwise all these jobs get stuffed up and you end up having to go back to them all. Um, so they'd go through the description. We'd, we'd, uh, the night before, I would do the travel plan. So I'd go um, and figure out what the quickest route is for all these jobs before they would go out and do the jobs. Um, and it worked really well. And then post shift, I would, I would do much of the same. I'd communicate with them and ask them, it was after they finished work, I'd ask them how it all went. Was there any problems with any customers, any, any add-on sale that the customer might need that I might need to go and quote for? And the big reason for these, these pre-shifts and post-shifts for me was really about creating more of a culture uh, within, within my business. And it was because the guys like getting together every morning and talking with each other and having a few darts and talking about, they used to play Pokemon Go together. Um, they really loved it, the Pikachu and all the rest of it. So they'd catch all these Pokemon every night and talk about it with each other every day. Um, and then uh, when they'd get, when they'd get uh, back for the post shift, well, of course, the person that's in the passenger seat of the car was sitting there playing bloody Pokemon Go while the car was driving. So they'd be catching Pokemon. And so what ended up happening was they loved doing it so much that, well, they worked really bloody hard when they were on the job and got it done as quickly as possible with fantastic quality because they didn't want to go back there just so they could get back in the car to play Pokemon. You know, it drives me crazy how that worked, but it was fantastic. It made me great sales. <laughs> Anywho, and so that was the culture I had. These guys are now best friends with each other. Um, and have, have you ever worked in a workplace where everything, like your boss treats you terribly, you've got no appreciation, you hate the bloke that works with you, he's a pain in the ass, um, and you just go, oh, stuff this place, and all of a sudden you realize that, you know, you're not, every day you go there, it's just the same thing. You're in airplane mode, and it's like, you're just doing 50% efficient. You're doing the bare minimum to just get through the day till you can go home, sit on the couch, have a few beers. Do you, does any, has anyone been through that? Yeah. Yep, cool. Now, have any, has anyone here been through the situation which is the exact opposite, where your boss really respects you, appreciates you a lot? When you go to work, it doesn't feel like work because you, you're, uh, you're catching up with your best friends, and you love being there and you talk with them non-stop and you just, while you're working, you're talking and you love it and efficiency is great. You're probably working 200% what you should. Anyone been through that? Yeah. Cool. That's what I created in my own business and I did it because of what I was doing while I was at McDonald's. Um, and I'd learned it from McDonald's, the different cultures, um, from, from being in a store where the Shake and Sunday machine doesn't work every single day. Frank's to McDonald's, thank you. Um, <laughs> where, there's, uh, where there's stores that obviously everything runs perfectly because everyone loves working there, so they put extra effort in to make sure that everything is always perfect. Um, so I'd done this and also it just felt right. And as, as I said, it made, me, it made the job much easier. It made my role much easier because these guys, was, guys were taking on more responsibility. So I'd got, I'd got these employees. Um, now, what I was paying them um, often, often a lot of people say, well, what did you pay your employees? Um, so I started them off uh, on the lawnmower first. So I didn't get them to use the brush cutter. I got them, started them off on the lawnmower because I figured, well, they can't, you can't really stuff that up too much. Yeah, go on. Backup equipment. 
Yeah, okay. So what I did uh, for backup equipment, so during that pre-shift, I would always load up into each vehicle two mowers, two brush cutters, two blowers. No matter what. Every single shift, I always had... And, and they didn't need two mowers in there because there was one guy brush cutting, one guy mowing. And so the guy would jump out and he'd do the brush cutting first um, and then uh, he, he would brush cut the nature strip as soon as possible. The guy would then mow it. Um, he would go to the backyard, brush cut that. The guy would mow eventually the backyard and the, the guy that's brush cutting would do the blowing at the end. And then if, if there was any extra time, he would start filling up petrol in the blower or the brush cutter or the extra mower or whatever it was. So it always worked out pretty well. But the reason that we had the extra equipment was because if anything broke down, if anything wasn't working, um, well, you had the extra mower sitting there or the extra brush cutter over whatever it was, so you were saving time. You didn't have to come back to the yard and come get it because that's, uh, that's obviously costing money because you've got then two people that aren't, aren't um, you know, making money. So I had... With that said, I had two people in a team. So what I did was I had them first doing their own 80 regular customers every fortnight or whatnot, but then I realised they enjoyed working with each other more when they, were with together, with, when they were together and they got more done. So if I put two people together, I had people that were motivated to work because they were with their friend all day and they didn't want to let their friend down. And so they would work just as hard as their friend to be able to get all these jobs done. Um, and it, Yeah, so they could have done them by themselves or they could do them together. So they just did them together. But they, they, so what, they, they spent half the time on each job? Yeah, because there was two of them. absolutely, yeah. So, and then I tried, I was like, oh, geez, this works fantastic. So I tried to put three people together in the same vehicle. Well, that didn't work at all. That was terrible. Um, and so I don't know if anyone's had that happen before, but uh, what happens when you've got three people doing a job, if they're at a mowing job, is you have got one guy mowing, one guy brush cutting, and the other guy blowing, or he'll try and do whatever he can in between. He might grab the other brush cutter. And you always, for whatever reason, you always have the, there's the third person that always takes it a bit easier on that job. And then they get together, and at the next job, they'll go, all right, I took it a bit easy this job. I did these tasks. How about this time? You take it easy. And, uh, you know, and so you lose complete productivity. So um, from, from having... But motivation is very high. I mean, they're very happy. They're sitting there having laughs and talking nonstop and... So they're very, very happy with what they're doing. It's just that, you know, I'm, I'm losing money from it. So the perfect balance for me was definitely having two people together. Um, so if that, if that helps clear anything up. Um, now, I, I would bring them on and they would start mowing lawns at $25 an hour, um, casual. And uh, I, would, I would bring on... I wasn't so much looking for anyone experienced because people that were experienced didn't tend to really want to listen to the way that I mow lawns because I mow lawns tend to be a bit different to most people. I have procedures and processes for everything and formulas on how I do things. Um, and you know, one of those things is I want my, my employees to walk twice as fast. Well, someone that's experienced, they have their own set way. So you might tell them to do it, they might do it for the first week and then after that, they'll go back to their own ways. So I tended to bring on just new people that were completely new to the industry. So they get paid $25 an hour mowing lawns and then once they become an expert at, at lawn mowing, which would take usually about three months, four months, um, every now and then you get one that would take six months. Um, and then they would start brush cutting. And once they started brush cutting, I'd put their prices up to $27.50 an hour casual. Um, and so they'd be brush cutting now, and there'd be another person doing the lawn mowing, and they'd learn how to do that. And once they become, become an expert at that, which again would take probably about three to four months, then I'd put them on to $27.50 an hour part time. So they got, the, um, they got the extra expenses. Now, they also had the option of going to $30 an hour casually if they liked, but everyone just went part time. Um, and then the, when they were at that point, they, could, they would start managing the team of two. So they'd be in the vehicle and they'd have the, uh, the offsider with them or the person that's less experienced than what they are. And so they'd start managing that team. They'd make sure they could get through the day efficiently. And once they, would be, uh, once they become good at doing that, then I'd put them on to $30 an hour part-time. Um, and then from there, then they would help starting to manage my whole team. So they'd start helping manage the six employees and the daily schedule and doing the travel plan and dealing with fixing the equipment. And so then they would go on to salary and, and I usually pay them. Well, Tristan, he was my, he was my 2AC. He was on about $75,000 a year salary plus the benefits and overtime. And, the, and it was definitely overtime. Um, and, and we had Mike, he was on 65000 an hour salary and he would, he would uh, fix the equipment for me on the side and, and, and make sure that everything was running and operating effectively. Um, and so that's how I set up my, my business system. Um, and so um, one of my things was, it's, I, can teach, I, I, I can teach 
most people how to run a lawn mowing business. I can't teach them how to stay motivated. I can tell you how I am motivated, but I don't know what motivates you. And so what motivated me at the start was definitely money. I needed money coming into my account. Um, and then it got to a point where I had money. I was making $5,000 a week at, at one point. Um, and now the motivation became I wanted to see if I could break my own records. I wanted to see how far I could push this thing. When I brought on employees, my new motivation, and they were all still my motivation the whole way through. It was not like a, one dropped off. Uh, my, my new motivation was I, uh, I wanted to make sure that every single employee that worked in my business, no matter what, had at least 35 hours a week. Minimum, no matter what. Because if I was bringing on someone that was going to work in my business, I was going to look after them because I'd said, hey, join my business, help me out, grow this business. Um, I'm, do I'm going to do whatever I possibly can because they put their faith into me to be able to... Obviously, I've employed them, so I want to make sure that I can look after them so they can put food food on the table, keep a roof over their head, do whatever they possibly need to do. Um, and so it, it did become a little bit challenging because it's such a seasonal business, especially when you're coming into the winter months and you know, your frequency starts to drop off. Well, you know, how, do you, how do you find the hours to be able to make sure they minimum have 35 hours a week, which is where I started, um, started doing, learning a lot more about local area marketing and doing much more local area marketing. Is this permanent on here as well? No. You um, you <laughs> I, 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 just so you know, in Australia, not all markers are like this, I swear to God. Like, we actually have proper markers that just come straight off. I don't want you to go back to America and be like, yeah, the one thing about Australia. And have you tried Vegemite yet? <laughs> oh my God, this is the worst marker. Here we go. I'm going to flip it the other side. Yeah. Let's see if this one comes off easy. Oh my God. This is a serious problem. Joel, in the next budget, can we get a... <laughs> what a nightmare. Thanks, mate. All right. Flip chart marker. Yeah, we're safe. All right, cool. All right, I've just fixed the, uh, the problem for all the new presenters coming on so they can thank me later. Um, all right, so I started doing more marketing. Now I needed to create demand. Um, and so um, what I'd done was I had all these ideas for marketing that I'd done. And so I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you, my, you guys my top 10 tips for what worked in my business. They may not necessarily work in yours, but this is what I did mostly in mine. So um, the first one um, was add-on sales. Now, when I did add-on sales, I didn't do add-on sales like most, every, uh, most other people do add-on sales. Um, the way that I did add-on sales is, well, most people wait for the customers to come to them and say, hey, can I get a quote for this? What I did was I would create a list. When I was looking for work, I'd create a list of every single client that I had. And I'd go through the list one by one, and I'd think of a specific add-on sale for each customer's property, something specific to their property that they needed. They might have needed their right-hand garden bed weed hand-weeded or they might have needed their gutters cleaned, or they might have needed cobwebs removed from the eaves, or whatever it bloody was. I, they might have needed something, and I would sit there and I would think of something specific that they needed, because if I knew I could think of something specific that they actually needed, my, uh, well, the, the possibility of me winning that job was, well, I had a much greater chance. So I would uh, email through the quote to the customer. They didn't even ask for it. I would email through the quote to the customer, my specific add on sale with the price already done. I already emailed, quote given, boom, haven't even asked for it. Didn't even know about it. And then I would call that customer and let them know, hey, I just thought I'd let you know, I've sent you through a quote um, for this, sort of, this work that I noticed that you need done at your property. Just letting so you know, I am looking for work at the moment and I'd love to be able to help you out. If I can't help you out with this service, is there any other service that you might need done? And so that's how I would do my add on sales and it worked beautifully. I had, uh, I had a fantastic, um, amount of amount of sales coming through, which would help me continue to give my employees 35 hours a week. So that was my first one. 
I always did, and as I said, the way that I did my ad on sales was different to what most people do. So I would email, then I would call. Not, not so much a text message. Text messages weren't personal enough for me. If anyone knows me, they know that I don't text message very well. Everything's got to be a call. Um, or if I, if I was going out to that customer's property, I would go see them face to face. That's even better. Um, so that's the first one. Uh, the next one is, uh, have any, most of you guys in here, this room would have heard of NDIS by now. Yep, cool. So I had NDIS. Now, NDIS, I figured this out um, a little while back. The way that it works is you have, you obviously have your plan managers and they're like the sort of the middleman that have, has the client's budget and they send it through to the, um, the, uh, the, the actual NDIS through the portal. Um, and so for that, you need to be registered. Now, if you're doing plan managed or self-managed work, obviously you don't need to be registered as most of you would know. Um, and so each uh, client uh, with NDIS or um, participant, uh, they can either choose to have a support coordinator or maybe they manage it themselves. So a lot of them have support coordinators. Now the average support coordinator tends to look after between 20 to like 50 clients each. Um, so I figured, well, I need, I want work through the NDIS and if I can get onto one support coordinator and uh, build a relationship with them, well maybe I've just opened up the door to like 50 clients and I've, I've just won 50 clients in one big hit. Um, so I'd go out, out of my way to be able to get in contact with these support coordinators. I would, I would talk to them and then I'd say, do you know any other support coordinators that I can talk to? So sure enough, I was able to win quite a fair bit of work from that. Um, I'll just make that a bit more clear, support coordinators. Um, so, um, there's a few big companies out there. Usually what I would do is I'd call the plan managers and then I'd ask them if they had any list of support coordinators that might work for them or they might do jobs for them um, and, and you know, subcontract to them. Um, and so they'll give you, you know, a few different su uh, support coordinators and then you go and ask from there on. Uh, or you speak with random clients and they, they might have a support coordinator that they're using now and they might have an old one that they used to have. Yeah, you had a question? Doing actual NDIS work, like not through plan or anything. Yep. How did you get around with like the forty three dollars? Forty nine dollars thirty or whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I would explain to the support coordinators or the plan managers or whoever it was that I quote per job, and I'd make sure I got it in writing. I quote per job. I'd not quote per hour. Just because someone says says to me, "This is the hourly rate that you're going to charge us," it's my own business. I choose what I charge my my jobs at. I'm not going to sit there and let someone else dictate to me exactly what I'm going to charge. Because yeah. I've actually found that if the customer calls up gyms and or does, or does a uh, inquiry online, I've found that they will only do the $49 or whatever it is. Yeah, yeah. So you, you, the actual company, you can charge whatever. Go on. I've yep. found that in the same case that the support coordinators that yep. you approached, I said, yeah. look, the customer is really wants me to do the work, but Jim's pricing is this, so I'm not working for life. And they said, look, Scott, we really want you to do the job. They like you, they keep them happy. $49.30 times at 5.3, you've got your quote price. It's actually slightly off. That's exactly it, yeah. So, and I, I would always get it. Now with the NDIS inquiry about people overcharging, whether there's going to be a fight back. I get it in writing. I get it in writing. So, but that's how I do it, and that's how Pretty much, I reckon most people in this room would probably do it. Uh, if I, am I wrong on that or not? Nearly every single contractor out there would do it like that. So I keep that in mind. Um, and that's the same with like TAC or Gallagher Bassett or whoever it is that you're going through. So that's how I dealt with that. Um, third one is, this is something that uh, some people don't really enjoy doing. Um, it takes a bit of guts because you, you deal with a lot of rejection. Um, cold calls. So I would do cold calls to random businesses in my territory. I would also do cold calls to previous clients or previous leads that I might have taken on. Um, so even if they didn't convert, and I would call these customers up, all these businesses up in my territory, all, my, all vacant territories, and I'd just explain to them the same thing that I'd say every time, I'm looking for work, um, is there anything I can help you out with? Any service at all? And then I'd explain to them what sort of services I can help them out with. Uh, maybe, it's, uh, maybe it's a previous customer that I've done work for two years ago, hey, do you need this done again? Whatever it is, so you go out there and you do specific cold calls. Uh, does take up a bit of time. Um, you have to be very, very good re with rejection. 
Um, it's a good thing that I uh, wasn't all that beautiful in primary school, so I dealt with a lot of project, uh, rejection anyways. <laughs> Um, all right, next one is uh, letterbox drops. So, as I said, I started using business cards first. Um, and, you know, it, it was all right. It wasn't fantastic. Uh, but magnets was really where it was at. Um, and so I would do 3,000 uh, magnet drops a year. Every single year I'd do 3,000. I still do them. still do them in my business. I think they're fantastic. Um, and... You always have customers coming back to you years later. As you explained before, Mike, um, when you get these customers, you find that they usually convert to the next year and the next year and the next year after that. So these magnets that I was spending money on, I would continue having them come, come back for every single year after that. Um, brilliant. Uh, the next one is... Yeah, yeah, I did. So yeah, so I would do. So what I would do is I'd, I'd do it usually throughout winter. So as soon as it hit winter months, and I'd go and start doing my leg, uh, letterbox drops, um, and then I'd do vacant territories around me, and then um, uh, my third year in, I went and did the same territory again that I'd done at the start. So if that helps you out, um, because you don't know, some people might throw it out, some people people might lose it. So like, yeah, how would you do success rate? With the, With the uh, letterbox drops, oh, it wasn't great. Like I would do a lot of letterbox drops. Um, I'm not going to sit here and say it was like one in ten or something because it definitely wasn't. It might have been like one in a street. So it might have been like one in a street, but I would still somehow. Uh, it would always be around on average about an extra thousand dollars a week in sales from it. Yeah, absolutely. People still call after that. So it, it might be thirty weeks into the year, and people will still call. So. And the reason is because is when you put a business card in someone's letterbox, uh, you've got the flyer on it, they see it and they go, junk mail, I'm not going to use that for anything. In the bin, done. You put a magnet in someone's letterbox. Now, I get really excited when I see magnets in the letterbox because I go, this is brilliant. I, I don't know about you guys, but when I see a magnet in a the letterbox, they stay on my fridge because I use them to be able to put my daughter's photos on the fridge or RSVPs or wedding invites or whatever it is. Is that the same as everyone here? Exactly. So that's I love seeing magnets in my letterbox. So because I'm, I like seeing them, I figured everyone else does. Exactly. Question on Mike and Marissa. Yep. Can you please ask them what he does with the no junk mail sign on the letterbox? Yeah, OK. Oh, simple. Just chuck it in anyways. No. <laughs> 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 so obviously, if there's, a, uh, if there's a no junk mail, then yeah, no, I don't, I don't put it in. I'm not, you know, I, it's probably not going to convert anyway. So I'll, I'm not going to go out of my way to piss someone off because they're just going to get on the phone to me and be like, how did you not see the sign? Um, all right, uh, next one is um, follow, up on pre follow up on previous quotes. Now, um, a lot of people don't really do this all that often. So you'll send a quote through and then you don't hear anything back from the customer, but then they don't follow up. They don't go, oh, well, why did that customer not give me a yes or a no or what happened there? You know, you just go, you assume it's a no. So what I used to do is I'd follow up with them. So I'd send a quote through. If I hadn't heard back from that customer within like a week, then I'd call them up and I'd say, hey, I sent through a quote. Did you see it? Are you happy to go ahead with it? Whatever it is. Now, they might say, oh, well, look, no, I'm, I, wasn't, I wasn't actually all that happy with the quote. I thought it was too expensive or what, whatever, whatever it may be. Now, if you're looking for work and you need work on, um, depends on how much demand you have, obviously, but you might be willing to negotiate on that price. You might be able to chuck it down by 10%. You might be able to chuck it down by maybe 20%. Um, so you would follow up on that, and it's not even just a week after. Like you might follow up on previous quotes that you sent through like six months ago, and say, "Hey, I sent you through a quote for gutter cleaning or whatever it bloody well is cleaning your oven." Just thought I'd just check. Have you? Did you end up getting it done, or would you like? Would you like to um, book it in? So that's what I would do, um, and it worked out really, really well. Um, and I would also, just on that as well, when I would get once-off jobs, and this is something I didn't learn until a little bit later, so you'd get your regular customers, and when you get a, a lead for a regular client, you go, yes, like this is amazing. Everyone gets really excited about it. But when you get a lead for a once-off job, you go out and do the job, but after you do the job, try and see if you convert them to a regular. Actually say to them, hey, face-to-face, -face, hey, would you like me to continue doing your property regularly for $75 a visit? Um, you might get a no, no worries, but then call them up again two weeks later, Oh, have you found anyone to be able to do your property regularly for $75 a visit? If you like, I, I can actually do it. And what I found was well, I was actually converting about one in three once-off jobs to, to regulars from doing that because I would stay on top of them. Um, so hopefully that helps out. 
Anyone in here? Um, um, in my region, um, as I said, I'm, as you guys would know, I'm, I'm a franchisor now. But everything I do is based around having a good culture. I like the idea of having a good culture. If you've got, if you've got people that are happy and positive and you know, have good work ethic and they love what they do, everything else seems to fall into place. Um, and my job becomes much easier. Um, where if, if you've got negative people um, that you've got um, in, your, in your region or even in your business as an employee or whatever it is, it sort of becomes infectious and it puts other people into a, you know, a, a worse mood. You don't want those sort of toxic people in your, uh, or, or, I suppose, definitely not in your business and definitely not you know, uh, around you. So um, I, would, uh, I do whatever I can to make sure that I only bring on... There's two things I look for when I'm bringing on uh, employees, by the way, and this is the same thing with franchisees, always these two things. I look for someone that's got a positive attitude and I look for someone that's got good work ethic, so someone that's going to care. Um, and, well, the reason for that is, is because they're the two things that I can't train. I can't fix those problems in people. Um, if, you've, um, if you've got someone toxic, um, it doesn't matter how hard you push and tell them, you know, hey, this is what we need to do moving forward, it's never going to work. And to be able to f find the proof in that is just go and call my ex-girlfriend. You'll find out that for sure. Uh, <laughs> but, um, no, but uh, so, yeah, when you've got positive franchisees, what happens is, you get to this point where these franchisees, most franchisees get to about 100 regulars or so, maybe 120 regulars in mowing. I don't know what it would be in cleaning. Um, and they, they're maxed out. They can no longer take on any more work. And so they might not want to build their business. They might not want to take on leads um, and they might not want to uh, you know, charge high prices or put on employees, sorry. Um, and, they, and they're not taking on leads for it. And, but they've got great service. And all these customers still want to be able to use their service, but they've got no time to book them in. Well, what happens is if you've got a, a franchisee that you're friends with or that you're close with, and they know that you're still building your business, for all those customers that they want to use their services and they can't fit them in, they'll pass them over to you and say, well, I can't do it, but Dan certainly can. He can help you out with that sort of work. I'll send you his number. And so you end up with this, with this position where you've, you uh, have multiple friends of, that are franchisees and multiple people that keep on sending you through all this work from all these clients that wanted their service that now gets sent on to you. And so that's the whole thing about gyms being one big family. We shouldn't be looked at each, uh, looking at each other as competition. We should be looking at each other as, as uh, you know, family or you know, um, definitely allies because we can really, really help each other build each other's businesses. Does anyone in here have a franchisee that you're super close with that sends on work to you? Yep, cool. Most of you, awesome. That's awesome. Um, and so, you know, a lot of people when they join up, they go, oh, well, I don't want you to put another person in my area because, you know, that'll take more work away from me. Well, maybe for the first three, six months, whatever it is, while that person's building up their business, maybe, yeah, they're, they're probably going to get a bit more work and whatever, what have you. But six months after, when they're at that point where they can no longer build anymore and they don't want to build anymore, they're going to be your ally. They're going to be the one actually helping you build your business even more. So, yeah, we are, we're, we're a team in this, I suppose, is, is what I'm getting at with that. So I would always network with franchisees and get work from them. Yep. You changed from being the individual worker and you started putting team members in the field. Did you get much pushback from the regulars changing over the service? What, not getting Dan turn up to the job? Yeah, so you, you certainly uh, at the start, I certainly did get probably a little bit, a little bit of pushback with it. Um, and so I would just explain to them that I've trained them my way. If, they, if they're unhappy with the quality of the service, I had, a, I had my own guarantee that I put in place. If they weren't happy with the quality of the service that that employee had given, I would go out and fix that job for them. And, uh, and then, you know, obviously, I would, you know, they would get another chance and, and move on from there and would put the, uh, add to the description that customer wasn't happy, this wasn't done, make sure it gets done next time on the job, uh, job schedule. So, but every customer knew that if anything went wrong, I would always come back to fix it. And my employees knew if I had to come back to fix a job, well, they all, they all had a lot of respect for me, they knew how hard I worked and so that would take more time out of my day and they never wanted that to happen. Um, so, if that, if that makes sense. Um, but then every now and then you do get problem customers that are just an absolute pain. Um, and so those sorts of customers, um, those sorts of customers, I would, uh, I would uh, do whatever I could to obviously stop them being, from being a pain. But if ultimately, if they're not going to, I would just explain to them, I'm sorry, I can no longer do your service anymore. Um, here's another number for another gardener that you might want to use. And he, he'd be able to give you a quote and that would move them along. And I could do that because I was always bringing on three new regular customers a week. So... 
Yeah. Um, so I suppose that's sort of that's sort of how I was uh, how I was building my business. And and one thing that I've as always I, I suppose it's part of me and, and who I am. Now I'll, I'll, I'll go through this, but I just want to add this one thing. A lot of people say, "Well, what's what's really important about building your business?" And I hear the answer, "Well, never give up." I, I hear that quite a lot, and it's 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 great. It's a it's a great quote to never give up. But for me, I, I take it one step further because you know never give up's one thing. And if you never give up, maybe you'll do all right. But for me, I focus on I want to be the best. I want to be whatever it is that I do. It doesn't matter what task it is. I want to be the best at whatever it is I do. The idea of never give, giving up isn't even in my head. It's not even a thought process there. The idea of uh, of um, being the best is you know you will never giving up isn't even a possibility. Failure, failure isn't even a possibility. And then when you become the best, you go, all right, well, how can I push it even further? I don't want to be the best, but I want to be 10 times better than the next person. So I, sort, I, I don't know about you guys, if you guys can understand that, but that sort of mentality, if you, if you, if you have that mentality, you'll do whatever it takes to be able to, to obviously um, build your business and succeed in it. Um, and it's, I, I suppose it's a bit more of a mental game. Now, I'll write down a few, few more of these. Um, so... Um, the next one is email your database. So you'll have, um, especially you guys being experienced, um, you'll have a database of clients that you've, you know, leads that have come through and you'll send through, uh, what I do is I send through an email to them um, and I do it probably every six months or so. Um, and so in Jim's jobs, there's a, there's a section in there where you can put bulk email and so you'll send that through to your clients. And what I do is I actually offer little specials as well to these customers. So I, first of all, I let them know I'm looking for work. And then after that, I'll, um, I'll also say, hey, I've got a discount on gutter cleaning or whatever it may be. Um, or if you refer a friend and they become a regular customer, I'll give you a free service or whatever, whatever have you. So that's, that's another way that I do a bit more marketing. And I tend to do that about every six months. Uh, we've got real estates, which is what I touched on before. Go in there and meet them face to face. Actually, talk to the property manager one on one, um, and you'll find that you get if you, if you go out there, talk to them face to face. Um, I give them like muffins uh, for Easter and for Christmas, or yo-yo biscuits, or um, you know maybe I'll give them Jack Daniels. Depends on what they like, but you'll end up finding much more work from coming from uh, coming from that as well. And that's the same with like. My local steel shops and my, uh, my lawnmower suppliers, even the local ladies at the tip, you end up getting much more work from that if you build a relationship with them. Um, we've got uh, number nine. Now, I always recommend that everyone get registered with these, these few um, agencies that I'm about to list up. So the first one is we've got uh, DVA. Uh, many of you guys registered with DVA? Take on quite a, yep, we've got one over there. So I registered with DVA, get work coming through from them. We've got... TAC, if you're in Victoria, TAC. Uh, yeah, no, TAC. <laughs> but yeah, get registered with TAC. Uh, if you're in another state, it might be some, called something else like MAIC for Queensland. Um, so get registered as preferred provider for them. Um, and then you've got a few others. So you've got work cover jobs. Um, now you've got a few different work cover agencies out there. Uh, you've got like Allianz. Anyone done work for Allianz before? Yep. Uh, Gallagher Bassett. Anyone done? Yep, cool. Few more hands awesome so you, there's a few different agencies for work cover and then it's the same thing uh, for aged care so aged care there's not just one there's there's several different ones so there's like our care home care Beata home care let's get home care. like there's a whole bunch of different ones so you get get signed up with them as well and um, some of them make you pay um, to be able to become registered with them uh, like NDIS, if you get registered with NDIS, it's, I believe it's about two and a half grand or so to get registered with them, where you know a few aged care ones are probably a couple hundred bucks. A lot of them will let you just get in, for, uh, become registered for free as well. Um, and then 10, now if I didn't put on this on the board, I'd get an uproar. So it's the big one, uh, word of mouth. So always talk to people. You go out and do a job, speak with a neighbor, speak with their friends, speak with your family, speak with your friends. Um, do whatever it is that you can to get in front of people. So that's a, that's a big one. And that's probably something that most of you guys use daily anyways. And it's just, it's something that naturally happens. I'll say, oh, can you do this service? Yeah, absolutely, I can. So those are my top 10 tips. There are other tips out there. You can go and do door knocking, you can go and do body corporate work, whatever it bloody well is. Um, but those are my 10. Um, so I'll leave it there for now because I think we're probably running out of, out of time a little bit. 
But uh, if anyone wants to talk to me about any of the other processes that I have in place as well, um, I'll be around and we'll do a group, well, we have a group forum on later on, don't we? Yep. So I can answer any of those questions as well. Yep. Uh, so friends and family, or it's actually more than that. It's for people just go, oh, well, I don't have that many friends. So what, what I do is I find friends that possibly have friends that possibly have family, and then I go and ask them. So I'll find out if there's anyone throughout those two avenues. So friends of friends of friends, or family of family of friends, and that's how I find that's how I find my people. I've, t I've tried to do Facebook advertising. I've tried to do Seek, all the rest of it. I'd never really had that much luck, and I didn't have people that cared about my business. When you use friends and family in avenues through that, they tend to care care much more. I don't know if, if you've ever had the same experience, or have you have you brought on any staff or not? Not in this, no. No, okay, no worries. But yeah, for me, it's friends and family. Yeah, you never used to, but you do now. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, um, any other questions? No? Cool. No worries. Thank you very much for that, guys. Thanks, Joel. Thanks, Thanks man. Thanks, man. Thanks, man. Thanks, man.